Um, look, it's all very well the stuff about banking system capital, but there's an overriding issue, which is there's been a huge focus on this in the last decade, really since the last crisis. Was the last crisis caused by the banks having too little capital? Now, I'm just put to you, I know that's a big question. Um, one answer is, if the capital that they had was inadequate relative to their losses, yes. Okay, you then got to look at the numbers. As far as the US is concerned, there was only one quarter um, of the Great Recession period in which the banks had a loss that was equal to 1% of their capital at the start of that quarter. After all of the quarters, apart from that, uh, the US banking system was profitable. The increases in capital demanded by officialdom, effectively as a result of the Great Recession, or the false interpretation of it, are everywhere a multiple of the losses that the banks incurred in the, in the critical period, except in places like Iceland, Ireland, and Greece. I'm not doing anything more, but um, I wrote the, um, I mean, Brown's a wonderful guy, and I really put my nice contributions and so on, but you know, I produced this book with a number of other people, I was editor, really to have a go at this rubbish, and it's rubbish that the great last the Great Recession was caused by banks having adequate capital. That was not the cause of the Great Recession. On the contrary, it was the, 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 the basic cause was in fact official demands that banks hold more capital. Because if you as a bank are required to have a higher capital asset ratio, and you cannot quickly raise your capital, you'll shrink your assets. If the assets are destroyed, that then destroys something on the liability side of the balance sheet, and most of the liabilities are deposits which are money. Therefore, the effect of a step jump in banks' capital asset ratios is to cause the destruction of money balances, etc. And I suggest you read this. There is a lot of rubbish around about the Great Recession. And I'm afraid Brandon didn't have a go for it. He should have done. Anyway, never mind. Um, um, I guess um, Juan uh, explained my career a bit. I, I was educated at Oxford, and um, well, I learned most of my economics before that, uh, and actually working in London, working in the city as a journalist, and I learned very little economics at Oxford. Quite long. So not not the economics I actually have used in my subsequent career, what I'm learning for. Um, I worked on the Times in the early 70s, well, 73, 76. There was a big inflation, and there was a big boom bust cycle. The question is why? And um, the reason essentially was um, that there was inflation because there was excessive growth of the quantity of money, broadly defined. And there was a boom and bust cycle because there was a big fluctuation of the rate of growth of the quantity of money because of events in the banking system. Um, and um, then you need to analyze the banking system. And I agree the kind of stuff Brandon was doing was part of that. Um, I developed my ideas, not in isolation, but looking back, I think it was pretty much in a sense by myself. And we then had a repetition um, of this cycle in the late 80s. This was from a government that theoretically was committed to monetary control in, to defeat inflation, and in fact, just simply repeated the heat barber boom of the early 70s uh, in the late 80s. And I forecast using the model that I had, and that I did actually bring together in a relatively organized way, uh, and um, I forecasted at the end the way that it did. Uh, and um, I was then on something called the Treasury Panel of the 1990s, uh, and um, so called wise men. I was very wise man, but that but there we are. Um, and um, I then had Long Bus Street Research as, as a business, and um, we produced forecasts using this model. Um, over the years, I became more and more disillusioned with what is taught um, in a university economics course particularly in macroeconomics. 
And what I want to do this afternoon is to explain to you aspects of that disillusionment um, and to really direct you in another direction, put you in another direction, um, and show the kind of things I'm interested in. Um, I should warn you that the kind of things I'm interested in are not at all standard macro. I saw at the start you're looking at Mankey. Mankey is a dreadful book, but it is typical of what is, it is, what is used in universities to teach young people. It's a, all, these, all this stuff is so misleading, it's so wrong. And I hope you can see that at the end of my presentation. All right. Um, the, um, you know, I don't dispute that if we start off in economics, you know, there's microeconomics, and that's relatively straightforward. Okay, um, supply and demand curves assumes rational people, assumes maximization, it all kind of works. It's used in welfare economics and social cost benefit analysis. And, then there's macroeconomics, where we're trying to determine aggregate demand and output for the economy as a whole, and I don't dispute we're trying to do that, and we're trying to do it in real terms in the short run. Yeah, that's fine, and then that has implications for employment. But there's something else we want to be able to think about what determines normal national income in the long run. We to have the same theories for both subjects. I suggest. And then, Frankly, when we get to my view, micro is relatively straightforward, relatively uncontroversial. It is threatened by things like behavioral economics. But um, macroeconomics is just a complete mess. Um, I haven't got time here now, but there are a whole range of different schools of thought um, that have been providing input to the debate on the Great Recession. Um, some of these have got banks included in them. It's clear banks were part, part of an important part of the story. Um, some don't refer to banking at all and do so quite consciously and deliberately. And these theories are taught in universities, etc., etc. Something plainly is wrong. Anyway, let me then just um, run through this. We want, in my view, a theory, as I say, it isn't just. What you're taught in Nanki, it all goes back to Keynes. It all goes back to Samuelson's distillation of uh, Keynes in the 1948 textbook. Um, and um, essentially, it is the determination of real output in the short run. It isn't really understanding um, what drives normal national income in the long run. Uh, and um, it's all about Marche in short run, I won't describe pin that down now, but it's about Marche in short run. It isn't about, say, growth theory. And growth theory should be part of macroeconomics as well and consistent with it. And this is going to be much more of my presentation this afternoon. Um, there is nothing in a standard macro course about what determines the level of the stock market. Okay. And um, to me, trying to understand the behavior of an economy without having the determination of the value of the stock market and the real estate market, how it's in commercial real estate, is crazy. Anyway, let me then just um, proceed with this. Um, so, what you get um, from Mankey, Samuelson, and all these related books is this idea that uh, a national income is equal to some consumption plus investment. Then it can get more complicated in the United States and you know, the foreign sector. But what it's all about is this sort of final proposition that national income is a multiple of autonomous expenditure. This is really where I come back to my point that what you're taught in a standard macro course always focus on the pricing of bonds and then with a good idea of interest and the effect of that on investment um, is actually very misleading and unrealistic. You see, that the bonds have got fixed income. It's because they've got fixed income, a rate of interest, that you would use this theory to determine the rate of interest. By the way, in my quadrant diagram, I determined four interest rates, including the central bank discount rate and the bond rate. Um, but variable income assets do a little negative change. 
rents on property also can be altered. Okay? They're variable income, they grow with nominal GDP normally. They're much more important. In the long run, they're likely to grow roughly the incomes in line with nominal GDP. Not taking it as a whole. All right. um, I, these are just numbers, you don't need to write them too much, but roughly speaking, um, in most countries, wealth is about five or six times GDP in most of the calculations that are made, which are very much concerned with um, the value of assets that one can buy and sell, titles to these assets. What they don't include, by the way, is human capital. And human, if you add in human capital value of the, of the, the people, you would get a figure of more like um, well, uh, national income divided by, say, 3%. It's about 30 times GDP. But, but of course, well, slavery is not allowed, so, rightly so. So, we don't normally include all of that in our, but these kind of figures of, say, five times is quite normal. And then I've done the split between the, the different types of assets in America in the recent past. This actually is value of, of, of in, in, in trillions of dollars. Um, it happens to end up with a number rather like $100 trillion, but um, you can see that um, it's dominated by you know, the three big uh, pies, uh, in, in uh, three big slices of the pie are real estate, mostly housing, uh, the life and pension assets, which would include quite a lot of bonds, I should add, and then 22.6%, which is 22.6 trillion, which is um, actually the value of equities, which includes unquoted equities in small businesses and uh, things like law firms. Okay. And then these things in percentages. And you can see that um, bonds as such, just here, right. And yet what you're taught in the University of America, of course, is all about this. Now I know that um, Banks have some bonds. I know that life and pension and pension funds have quite a lot of bonds. However, you know this is not the dominant asset. That it's uh, it's real estate, houses, commercial real estate, uh, and e equities that are the really the key thing uh, in the valuation of national wealth. And when we think about the um, uh, these really surely what we should be thinking about most of all when we're trying to understand why there are fluctuations in economic activity. Um, now these chaps, the 1930s, 1940s, they didn't want to talk about that. Keynes himself, who, as I say, was not a, not a lefty, uh, was in fact a very aggressive investor and took lots of risk. He kept the equity market out of the general theory. And um, this got uh, much more pronounced um, with Samuelson, not actually in his textbook, but in 1966 news article, he said the stock markets predicted nine of the past five recessions. Scorning the stock market, scorning the assessment of theories that would lead to the discussion of <coughs> stock market valuations and valuation of uh, housing as well. Someone like James Tobin, um, uh, he was in favor of taxing transactions in financial assets, particularly foreign exchange. Okay, so let's just be clear about what these people were after. You see, there's a lot of politics behind all this. You may think Mankey's very technical. Hmm. Was Samuelson just a technical textbook? No, there wasn't. There was an agenda here. And the agenda was that they were lefties. You see, Samuelson was not extreme leftist. Samuelson despised Marx. But no, no, he, he didn't like American capitalism. Well, he made it very well out of it. Out of it. Um, and uh, in his textbook, 1961, second edition, America, uh, America allegedly had GDP only twice that of the Soviet Union had grown more slowly since 1945. So apparently, uh, a Russian GDP was going to catch up with the United States uh, no later than 1997. 
at the moment, uh, the GDP of Russia, the population has gone down because of the end of the Soviet Union, but the GDP of Russia is about less than a thirteenth, it's about 7% about of the US earnings. These guys were wrong, therefore, in that sense. And as I've just you know, re-emphasized re here, that, that, that the, they didn't want to talk about the determination of value of variable income assets. Okay? Um, essentially, all you're taught is this stuff with the quick, the quick reference theory, the rate of interest. Okay? Then the link up to investment, then uh, national income is a multiple of um, autonomous spend. What I've done here, just to show you how wrong this theory is, um, is to show you the contribution of different asset types to changes in American household wealth going back to 1946. Bond shows the, is, is the, um, the, the effect of changes in bond valuations on the total change in the value of wealth as a percentage. There are one or two cases, like 1994, where um, it's actually not, not so, but these are usually years when there isn't much change overall in household wealth. See, there are many years, you know, like for example just here, uh, where you know, there's hardly any effect at all from a change in, in the bond price in, in, in total, total wealth. Right? Um, and let's also be clear that um, you sometimes get years in which the, this is another way of putting the same picture, this is the value of change value of real estate and equities against the value of bonds. It wouldn't matter if the movement in the bond price was a good indicator of movements in asset values in general, but that isn't true. You can have the value of bonds falling through a rise in the bond yields when equities and, re and real estate are rising. Um, it simply isn't the case that the bond price is a good guide to as as movement of asset prices in general. I'm just going to, I have my game quick, I'm going to go for time. Five, ten minutes more. No, all right, fine. Well, let's go through this very quickly. Um, what you'll see here is um, household net worth over that whole period um, as a multiple of disposable income fluctuates. Sometimes it fluctuates quite a lot, like, say, here, this is 2008. Um, or this is 1974, 75. Back so both of those years in a second. Um, but you see it's stable over time. Okay? Um, in a sense, this is the practical meaning, I would say, of what Friedman was getting at in 1956. You need to include all of these capital assets in the discussion of monetary theory and then of macroeconomics. Um, huge rises in the household net worth and, and disposable income, but the ratio between the two hasn't changed very much. All right. This is money, and again, sometimes it's changed quite a bit. You see here, there were high real interest rates, so people held more money relative to their total assets than at other times, but the ratio today is much as it was back in the 1940s. What I suggest is, that um, the, I'm just going to move on, I'll, I've slightly got this out of order. The simplest thing to say about, um, very much simpler than what you're talking about, of course, is that in the long run, the change in quantity of money is the same as, roughly the same as, the change in equity and national income. I know there are things that can alter the demand to hold money balances and alter equity and velocity. I know that. But as a starting point, that's not bad. And not only that, but also the same the percent change in, in uh, money is associated with a, with a similar percent change in the equilibrium value of variable income assets, which are by far the most important assets actually found in practice in capitalist economies. Very simple, much simpler than what you're taught in textbooks. Very, very simple. So once you're taught typically, and you look at Mankey, I'm sure he's got, you look at the back, liquidity trap. 
all goes back to Keynes, 1936, Dennis Robertson's, who despised what, not much what Keynes was saying, just kind of talking about this Keynes and the Quidditch trap, this was Robertson invented the phrase. And then this point, monetary policy in those circumstances is ineffective. And that's their <laughs> game. Monetary policy doesn't work, therefore we have fiscal policy, therefore we just have an economy in which the state is very active. I think this is all history and textbooks and all sort of theoretical. No read Paul Krugman, most influential economic economist in the world in the New York Times. Right? Uh, and um, this all goes back to, uh, to Keynes and so on, all this stuff. And so I've just shown you that change in the value of bonds are trivial relative to changes in the value of equities in real estate. I think we want to understand what happened in 2008, 74, 75, 1929. In all cases, there was trouble in the banking system, the rate of growth of money fell. That affected both wealth, well, <coughs> wealth first, the stock market first, really, stock market, house prices, and then defense consumption, etc. Alright? Very simple. Quite simple what you get I'm taught in these book textbooks. Um, and um, in my view, this proposition should really be what you're taught uh, in a standard macro course. Much more straightforward than the stuff in the, in the textbooks. Okay, well, I think I've more or less covered the. Um, I just want to do one very. I'll just finish this off really. I won't really. I'll just spout it out and then I won't really bother to go. We've got some of these through the, the slides. But um, in most economies, the value of transactions is a very high multiple um, of the value of national income and expenditure. Um, you will find in Mankey, because I've actually I did a bit of work on Mankey. The statement that GDP is all the economy. I know it isn't. The, the bulk of the, the, so the transactions are a high multiple of national income. Now, it's true that um, national income equals national expenditure equals national output. So there's these three things that expose to the same. The value of transactions is a multiple of all three taken together. And then we think of thinking the flows of transactions. You can think of asset transactions. A fund manager sells uh, some shares, goes in the bank account, the bank account's then used to buy some more shares, etc. So basically, the money that flows of transactions are inside what you might call the asset circulation. All right? There's then the income expenditure, output, and circular flow, so called circular flow. It's not actually a circle, I'm about to explain. Because then there's other flows of transactions where somebody sells some shares to buy a car or to buy a holiday. Or postpones buying a car or a holiday because actually it's just seen the value of his pension fund and sadly he's got to top it up, otherwise not going to reach the thing he wanted to get to when he was age 60. Therefore, there are transactions that connect the asset circulation and the income expenditure circular flow. Right. The value of these transactions is a huge multiple of all of the transactions inside the income expenditure output circular flow. And because it's you, the dominant source of the fluctuations in demand that we find in the modern economy arise from leakages between the asset circulation and the income expenditure circular flow. And they're motivated by large fluctuations in asset prices caused by, ultimately, events in the banking system that affect the rate of growth of the quantity of bonds. Do you think that is more realistic than what you're taught about in banking? Of course it is. Yeah? Uh, and uh, I might just raise through these now. Um, but I, ironically, Keynes himself had in his treatise of money, the 1930 book, not the general theory of 1936, he had a lot about these different types of transactions. He called uh, what I call the asset circulation, or financial circulation. And he was really thinking about 
He was a very active investor. In those days, most homes were owned by landlords, uh, and they weren't widely held outside the upper middle classes, uh, and by the aristocracy too, to some extent. Um, most people rented their homes. Of course, nowadays, many people own a home. And um, anyway, in my view, it's much better phrase is asset circulation to include uh, transactions in real estate. And there's constant arbitrage between all these assets and also between the asset circulation and income expenditure circular flow in the way I explained. I mean, if you've just had a huge capital gain, say from selling your stake in the law firm, yeah, or, or from you know, retiring from Barclays, or all your, your, your shares piling up with you. Then you have a holiday, you know, and you just pay for it in large part because you just had a big capital gain. Um, this is really the point I've just made to you. This is what we should be concerned about, trying to understand these things. Now, I did actually one thing in my career. I actually wrote a paper in 1992 um, about mortgage equity withdrawal. Uh, which was trying to explain why at the time house prices weren't going up very much when there's been a tremendous boom in mortgage credit um, following the liberalization of housing finance in the UK rather surreptitiously, by the way, by Nigel Lawson with the full approval of Margaret Thatcher. Um, and this, paper, this phrase then circulated, there's a lot of papers about it now, um, but this is a classic example of the intersection of the asset circulation and the income expenditure output. Uh, to, well, it's not a circular flow because actually this idea that income expenditure output, no, you can receive income and buy an asset. Okay? So it's not circular. And yet all the textbooks say the circular. Um, just again make, making this point, um, <coughs> punchlines, the, the, the time the textbook is basically very misleading. <coughs> All right. um, and um, and the value of these transactions and hence the effective demand depends on the quantity of money the further removed from the behavior of the banking system. The banking system needs to understand how the quantity of money is determined, and for that we need to understand the balance sheets of the commercial banking system, including I can see to random capital, it's very important, I don't just do that, uh, and um, also what's happening with the central bank, how the central bank sets interest rates and so on. All these things are included in my component of the working with MSC. Um, and um, can I also just say on this front, by the way, that, that most of these textbooks didn't have a word about banking system capital. Um, until the uh, mid 80s. You know, it's the most basic part of, of the capitalist free market economy. You can imagine there's nothing in it about these useless books. And I'm not sure, that, maybe there's something in Mankey today, I'm not sure, but you know, all this stuff that macro prudential might be so very seriously overrated, but actually, none of this was there when I was taught uh, at, at Oxford in 69 to 73. No. Um, and then, you know, let's just be clear that this is really all about what kind of society we want to live in. All right. I'm, I'm completely open about this. Um, I'm not a lefty. I think we're very lucky to live in the kind of society we live in. There may be some problems with them, but basically they're wonderful societies to live in. We're lucky people, and um, we should keep societies in which, um, you know, private property, people are paid for what they do, what they produce, and, you know, they save and it's still theirs, etc., etc. And um, there we are. Okay, and I'm not in favor of, of the kind of um, society that Paul Samuelson and all the East Coast lefties want. Very good.
There are. This is really where I come back to my point that what you're taught in the standard macro course always focus on the pricing of bonds and then with a particular area of interest and effect about on investment um, is actually very misleading and unrealistic. You see, the bonds have got fixed income. It's because they've got fixed income, a rate of interest, that you would use this theory to determine the rate of interest. By the way, in my corporate diagram, I determined four interest rates, including the central bank discount rate and the bond rate. Um, but variable income assets do it as they can change. Rents on property also can be altered. Okay? They're variable income. They grow with nominal GDP, normally. They're much more important. In the long run, they're likely to grow roughly the incomes in line with nominal GDP. Not taking it as a whole. All right. um, I, these are just numbers, you don't need to write them too much, but roughly speaking, um, in most countries, wealth is about five or six times GDP in most of the calculations that are made, which are very much concerned with um, the value of assets that one can buy and sell, titles to these assets. What they don't include, by the way, is human capital. And human, if you add in human capital value of the, of the, the people, you would get a figure of more like um, well, uh, national income divided by, say, 3%. It's about 30 times GDP. But, but of course, well, slavery is not allowed. So, rightly so. So, we don't normally include all of that in our, but these kind of figures of, say, five times is quite normal. And then I've done the split between the, the different types of assets in America in the recent past. This actually is value of, of, of in, in, in trillions of dollars. Um, it happens to end up with a number rather like $100 trillion. But um, you can see that um, it's dominated by you know, the three big uh, pies, uh, in, in uh, three big slices of the pie are real estate, mostly housing, uh, the life and pension assets, which would include quite a lot of bonds, I should add, and then 22.6%, which is 22.6 trillion, which is um, actually the value of equities, which includes unquoted equities in small businesses and uh, things like law firms. Okay. And then these things in percentages. And you can see that um, bonds as such Here, right. and yet what you're taught in the university macro course is all about this. Now I know that um, banks have some bonds. I know that life and pension and pension funds have quite a lot of bonds. However, you know this is not the dominant asset. That it's uh, it's real estate, houses, commercial real estate, uh, and equities that are really the key thing uh, in the valuation of national wealth. And when we think about the, um, uh, these really surely what we should be thinking about most of all when we're trying to understand why there are fluctuations in the economic activity. Um, now these chaps, the 1930s, 1940s, they didn't want to talk about that. Keynes himself who, as I say, was not a, not a lefty, uh, was in fact a very aggressive investor and took lots of risk. He kept the equity market out of the general theory. And um, this got uh, much more pronounced um, with Samuelson, not actually in his textbook, but in 1966 news article, he said the stock markets predicted nine of the past five recessions. Scorning stock market, scorning the assessment of theories that would lead to the discussion of stock market valuations and valuation of uh, housing as well. Someone like James Tobin, um, uh, he was in favor of taxing transactions in financial assets, particularly foreign exchange. Okay, so let's just be clear about what these people were after. You see, there's a lot of politics behind all this. You may think Mankey's very technical. Hmm. Was Samuelson just a technical textbook? No, there wasn't. 
There was an agenda here, and the agenda was that they were lefties. You see, Samuelson was not extreme leftists. Samuelson despised Marx. But no, no, he, he didn't like American capitalism. Well, he made it very well out of it. Out of it. Um, and uh, in his textbook, 1961, second edition, America, uh, America allegedly had GDP only twice that of the Soviet Union had grown more slowly since 1945. So apparently, uh, a Russian GDP was going to catch up with the United States uh, no later than 1997. At the moment, uh, the GDP of Russia, the population has gone down because of the end of the Soviet Union, but the GDP of Russia is about less than a thirteenth, about, it's about 7% of the US ends. These guys were wrong, therefore, in that sense. And as I've just you know, re-emphasized re here, that, that, that the, they didn't want to talk about the determination of value of variable income assets. Okay? Um, essentially, all you're taught is this stuff that they put the quick reference theory, the rate of interest. Okay. Then the link up to investment, then uh, national income is a multiple of um, autonomous spend. What I've done here, just to show you how wrong this theory is, um, is to show you the contribution of different asset types to changes in American household wealth going back to 1946. Bond shows the is is the, um, the the effect of changes in bond valuations on the total change in the value of wealth as a percentage. There are one or two cases like 1994 where um, it's actually not not so. But these are usually years when there isn't much change overall in household wealth. See, there are many years, you know, like for example, just here. Uh, where you know, there's hardly any effect at all from a change in, in the bond price in, in, in total, total wealth. Right? Um, and let's also be clear that um, you sometimes get years in which the, this is another way of putting the same picture, this is the value of change value of real estate and equities against the value of bonds. It wouldn't matter if the movement in the bond price was a good indicator of movements in asset values in general, but that isn't true. You can have the value of bonds falling through a rise in the bond yields when equities and, re and real estate are rising. Um, it simply isn't the case that the bond price is a good guide to as as movement of asset prices in general. I'm just going to. I have my game quick. I'm going to go for time. Five, ten minutes more. No, all right, fine. Well, look, let's go through this very quickly. Um, what you'll see here is um, household net worth over that whole period um, as a multiple of disposable income fluctuates. Sometimes it fluctuates quite a lot, like, say, here, this is 2008. Um, or this is 1974, 75. Back, so both of those years in a second. Um, but you see it's stable over time. Okay? Um, in a sense, this is the practical meaning, I would say, of what Friedman was getting at in 1956. You need to include all of these capital assets in the discussion of monetary theory and then of macroeconomics. Um, huge rises in the household net worth and, and disposable income, but the ratio between the two hasn't changed very much. All right. This is money, and again, sometimes it's changed quite a bit. You see here, there were high real interest rates, so people held more money relative to their total assets than at other times, but the ratio today is much as it was back in the 1940s. What I suggest is, that um, the, I'm just going to move on, I'll, I've slightly got this out of order. The simplest thing to say about, um, very much simpler than what you're talking about, of course, is that in the long run, the change in quantity of money is the same as, roughly the same as, the change in equity and national income. I know there are things that can alter the demand, the whole money balances, and alter equity and velocity. I know that. 
But as a starting point, that's not bad. And not only that, but also the same the percent change in, in uh, money is associated with a, with a similar percent change in equilibrium, equilibrium value of variable income assets, which are by far the most important assets actually found in practice in capitalist economies. Very simple. Much simpler than what you're taught in textbooks. Very, very simple. So, once you're taught typically, and you look at Mankey, I'm sure he's got, you look at the back, liquidity trap. All goes back to Keynes, 1936, Dennis Robertson's, who despised what, not much what Keynes was saying, discussed, talking about this Keynes the liquidity trap, this, this Robertson invented the phrase. And then this point, monetary policy in those circumstances is ineffective. And that's their <laughs> game. Hmm. Monetary policy doesn't work, therefore we have fiscal policy, therefore we just have an economy in which the state is very active. I think this is all history and textbooks and all sort of theoretical. No, read Paul Krugman, most influential economic economist in the world in the New York Times. All right? Uh, and um, this all goes back to, uh, to Keynes and so on, all this stuff. And so I've just shown you that change in the value of bonds are trivial relative to changes in the value of equities in real estate. I think we want to understand what happened in 2008, 74, 75, 1929. In all cases, there was trouble.